Hi there everyone and welcome back to National 5 Biology Unit 3 Life on Earth. Today we're moving on to key area 2 which is distribution of organisms and it's a fairly quick key area we should get through it fairly quickly. So to start off with we are going to look at two new definitions for you abiotic and biotic factors. Now these really define where organisms will live. Abiotic and biotic factors are very very important and we're going to actually look at what these actually mean. So to start off with, abiotic factors. Abiotic factors are non-living variables that influence where organisms live. So you can have some examples here such as light intensity, temperature, soil pH and the moisture level of soil. So the main thing here is that these are not living. So light intensity, temperature, pH and moisture, they are not a living thing. Okay, so they are abiotic. One thing to remember as well is if you're asked to give an example of an abiotic factor, you have to use the right terminology. So you can't just say light, you have to say light intensity. Temperature is fine, pH and moisture, but light is one where some people uh, can get a bit confused with. So these non-living factors can influence where organisms live. For example, a plant, if the light intensity is not good enough, then they cannot live there. What you also need to know is how to measure these factors of both abiotic and later on biotic. And what you really need to focus on is how to measure these, what can go wrong, and how you can avoid any mistakes. So, in order to measure abiotic factors, we're going to look at light intensity first. And very simply, you can use a light meter to measure light intensity. So, if you've had a, a go at one of these in class, you should hopefully find that it's just a meter that you, you hold that soil surface, you point in the direction of sunlight, and it gives you a reading of light intensity. And that's a simple measurement of it. In red, what I've added in is some problems that can occur and how to avoid these. So for example, quite simply, if you're using a light meter, do not cast your shadow or anyone else's shadow onto the light meter because it will give you an inaccurate reading. So you have to be careful where you stand, where other people are standing, or any other shade, so you get an accurate reading of light intensity. Next we're going to look at temperature, another abiotic factor. So simply if you're measuring temperature of the air, you can use a thermometer. If you're measuring temperature of the soil, you can have a temperature probe, which you simply dig into the soil. One of the issues you can get with this is if you take out the probe and it has some soil left on it, especially damp soil, and then you go and take another reading, that soil that's been left on the probe can give an incorrect reading. So you have to make sure between each probe that you wipe down the probe itself to make sure it's accurate. In terms of soil, we can look at pH and moisture levels. And again, if you've used these, they're very simple. They're simply a soil pH level and a moisture probe that you plunge into the soil. This is the exact same issue as the temperature probe. You need to make sure that you get rid of that leftover soil, otherwise you'll get an inaccurate reading. So now moving on to biotic factors, which are different from abiotic factors. So biotic factors are living factors, living things. So if you think you're studying biology, biology or bio means living. So think biotic factors living, abiotic, non-living. As long as you get that in your head, you will be fine. So some examples of these biotic factors are things such as predation, disease, and competition for resources. So if you think of this picture here just now of a lion and a zebra, predation is a living thing eating another living thing. It's a living factor. Competition for resources, we looked at in key area one. Again, living things uh, fighting each other effectively. The one that people forget about and often think is an abiotic factor is disease. You have to think that disease is actually a living thing and therefore it is then as a biotic factor. The other one that we have a look at here, which is really the same as competition for resources, is food availability, fighting over these different resources. And grazing is the same as that. So again, you need to know how to sample biotic factors, which is a, a bit different from abiotic factors. So if we have a look at how to sample living things, it's obviously going to be different from just picking up non-living things such as light intensity, temperature, pH and that sort of thing. Hopefully you've had the chance to use quadrats and pitfall traps during your time in class. If you have not, we're going to be running through these anyway. So a quadrat is effectively uh, a set of squares that you can throw and you have to throw randomly 
uh, onto an area of grassland and use that to count the abundance of plants in that area. One sort of inaccurate reading you can have is if you choose where to throw. So often you have uh, a big grassy area and you're there to calculate the abundance of daisies. You have to throw this randomly so that you actually get an accurate result of the abundance. So you get a good idea of the abundance of daisies because if you go and actively look for a bunch of daisies and place the quadrant on top of it, that is not going to give you an accurate reading. So it's very important that you throw or place the quadrats randomly. Quite a common question that comes up. The only issue with quadrats is that if you're trying to catch or measure living things, is they can simply walk out of the squares. And that's quite difficult to do. So if you're having to catch insects, small bugs, anything like that, you use a pitfall trap. Very simply, pitfall traps are used to sample small invertebrates. You can see in this diagram here. And effectively, it's a little trap. You can often use a, a yogurt pot or something, dig it into the soil, have a lid on top of it, and small invertebrates will fall into it. And you can count them later on to have a, a good idea of the abundance of invertebrates in that area. One of the things that must happen, though, in order to keep this reliable, keep this accurate, is that the traps must be covered to stop rain getting in and also to be disguised because if you have a pot full of bugs and it's not been covered up either the rain can get in and can kill everything or birds can go and eat all the bugs that are there uh, if these birds come and eat the bugs then you have no results you think there is nothing there there could have been quite a lot so this is one thing again common question how can you ensure this is reliable cover up the trap, camouflage it to make sure that the, the bugs, the invertebrates, are not eaten. Once you've, you've used a pitfall trap or you've used your quadrant or you're identifying any sort of organism, we need to look at how you can figure out what organism this is. So we look at identification of keys as one of these things. There are two forms of keys that you can be asked in natural fly biology to use to identify organisms. They can be it's called a branching key or a paired statement key, and we'll look at some examples here. This would be an example of a normal branching key, where you can just see the questions go in branches, and you basically have to answer yes or no, or some other form of binary answer to each question to then find out what's going on. So for example, if you're holding a bit of, a, a bit of plant, and the first question is, is it an animal? You'd say no. It gives you a lot of selection, says, can it be seen by the naked eye? You'd maybe say yes, and follow these questions, and it will eventually tell you what the organism is. Often the exam, they will give you some blank questions or blank answers, and you have to fill them. It's a bit more of a sort of problem-solving type question. You'll be given an organism, and you'll break it down into different questions so you can identify them. The other form of key is this paired statement key, which comes up very often as well. It's effectively the same thing, but instead of a branching structure, you're just given a question. You answer the question and go on to another question. So for example here, if you have a fly, if it said body with legs or body without legs, you could say what the answer is there and then move on to your next question. Once you go down them, you will find out what the organism is that you're trying to identify. To actually show you what this is, is like and what sort of questions you can get, this is a past paper question here, where you're given a set of questions on the physical appearance of an unnamed organism, and you have to use these questions, this pair statement key, to get the correct answer. So if you were given this organism here, and you have to use this pair statement key, use the questions and answer the questions to find out what it is. If you pause, I will now go through the answer. So you would find that this unnamed organism must be a chilopoda. The reason for that is the first question, you look at it and it clearly has more than six legs. So you go to question two. Question two, it still has more than eight legs. So you go to question four. In four, you have to choose between one pair of legs per body segment or two pairs of legs per body segment. When you look at each segment, there is one pair of legs on each one. So it must be chilopoda. Have a practice of these sorts of questions because they're not too difficult just as long as you're paying attention to what the organism is. Finally, in this key area, we're going to look at something called indicator species. 
And what these are, are these are different species that indicate environmental quality or pollution levels by either being present or absent in the area. So often we have uh, invertebrates in freshwater and lichens for air pollution. And we'll look at these in a little second. So for example, lichens. Lichens are a really good indicator of air pollution levels. If you have uh, a very nice clean atmosphere, then you tend to find uh, a large variation, different species of lichen. If you have not a great uh, level of air quality, if you have quite high air pollution, you'll find less lichens. So this would be an example of an indicator species. If you have more lichens, there is less air pollution, if you look at this diagram here. Secondly, in water, there's a couple of ones that we can look at here. You can use freshwater invertebrates in order to indicate what the water pollution levels are like. So for example, if the water is, is very clean, it's very high quality, and it has a high oxygen concentration, you will find nymphs such as mayfly and stonefly. However, if the river has, say, had quite a lot of sewage, or there's been something else going on, there's a lot of pollution, there'll be a low oxygen concentration, and you'll contain species such as sludge worms. That would indicate high pollution, again, an indicator of species. A good way of remembering this is sludge worm sounds horrific, so it must be in a fairly bad or a poor quality area. So that is Karia 2, distribution of organisms. So again, there's a few things for you to be memorising definitions, if you think of abiotic and biotic and examples of them. For the measuring of abiotic and biotic factors, you really just need to look at what can go wrong and how you fix them. With your paired statement keys and your branch keys, have a look at how you can either construct them or use them to identify an organism. And for the indicator species, just think of what an indicator species is and examples of them in both air quality and freshwater quality. So thanks so much for listening, folks. The next one is going to be photosynthesis, and I will get this up fairly soon. I know people are uh, worrying about this for prelims, so we're trying to get these uploaded as quickly as possible. Thanks so much for listening.